Every once in a while, a standard in practice at the Disney parks will change or reverse itself, sometimes reversing a precedent set back in its opening in 1955. The reception online will inevitably involve a subset of people reacting with suspicion and a chorus of what Walt would have wanted. And that always strikes me as funny. Because while Disney didn't cast the rules of theme parks in iron and trudge the tablets down from on high, how Walt did things was a purposeful, calculated decision in reaction to the way things had been done before. Just like today's decisions are doing the same. And I think it's important to put Disneyland in that proper technological context. This is how Disney parks change the landscape of culture forever. Let's start by clarifying this is not some fawning pan to the mouse. Both Henry Ford and Thomas Edison had utterly odious business practices, but their contributions to technology changed the world both economically and culturally. Disneyland is absolutely no different. In the technology of leisure spaces, the opening of Disneyland represented a huge leap forward that I don't think has ever quite been paralleled. But to fully grasp that scope, we have to look at the landscape of amusement parks and public opinion of them before 1955. It's okay, pie, new pickles, and ice cream. Eat all you can, be a glutton, stuff yourselves. It's all free, boys, it's all free. Hurry, 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 hurry. The rough house, the rough house. It's the roughest, toughest joint. Disney released the film Pinocchio in 1940, and one of its most memorable scenes was this one, Pleasure Island. It was one of the first depictions of the sinister amusement park, and 1940 audiences would definitely have recognized the setting at play. Because, at that time, places like Pleasure Island weren't built with children in mind. And a place like that teeming with only children would have put audiences' teeth on edge. Hey, There's something phony about all this. Some of the first amusement parks grew from both traveling fairs, filled with menageries, freak shows, and novelties, and world's fairs, exhibitions of industrial achievements, including those built strictly for leisure, like the first carousels. Railway and trolley companies made a killing building lines to beaches and piers for trafficking weekend trippers to their symbiotic partner parks like Coney Island and Blackpool Pleasure Beach. Often these parks were owned by the trolley companies themselves. So monopolies and exploitation were always a bit in the DNA. But the big thing about these parks that existed in the almost century before Disneyland is that they were designed for adults. Sure, kids could definitely attend, but this wasn't a place intended to suit their needs. For every cyclone or tilt-a-whirl, there was a diorama recreation of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Kids weren't meant to spend their pocket change on a shooting gallery or a can-can kinetoscope. Those were for adults. Kids were a bit of a collateral demographic, if anything. But there was a breed of amusement strictly for children called the Kitty Park, and it was... a glorified playground. It may have had a couple automated rides, a carousel here, a choo-choo train there, maybe story time with Mother Goose, but nothing for a parent to enjoy on their own. They let their little boomers free while they filled out crosswords? How do we ignore each other before smartphones again? But there was nothing for parents to do in a way that they could share the enjoyment with their kids. Heck, it was this kind of section of Griffith Park that bored Walt out of his skull enough to create Disneyland in the first place. Children and parents enjoying the same space wasn't solely some saccharine sales pitch for him, but the revolutionary idea to make art that doesn't exclude any age demographic. Where did you originally get the, the first notion for Disneyland? Well, it came about when my daughters were very young, and I, Saturday was always uh, Daddy's Day with the two daughters. So we'd start out and try to go someplace with, you know, different things, and I'd take them to the merry ground, and I took them different places, and as I'd sit there while they, uh, they rode the merry ground, did all these things, sit on a bench, you know, eating peanuts, I felt that there should be something built, some kind of a an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together. But it all started from a daddy with two daughters wondering where he could take them, where he could have a little fun with them too. <laughs> and how did Walt and the Imagineers do that? By scrutinizing every aspect of the amusement park and reinventing it. 
They approach the rides and scenery with the mindset of filmmakers rather than carnival barkers, filling the park with both passive and active narrative. The draw was no longer to look and participate in these modern marvels of industry, but to use those marvels as tools to craft an environment. This is where the concept of Imagineering was brought to the amusement park. Because the name and definition precedes its use and trademarking by the Disney Company by two decades. Thank you very much. When prior, the experience of the park played handmaiden to the function of the buildings and structures. The point of Imagineering as a concept is that the experience is the function, and any technical parameters are altered or obfuscated in the name of preserving that experience. Architecture and civil engineering do count as engineering, and both are vital in designing leisure spaces like amusement parks. So what kind of civil engineering did WED pioneer to change the landscape of the amusement park? Mostly things to improve the look and reputation of those parks in general. Think about Pleasure Island. This was the reputation amusement parks had masked by 1955. The places were dirty, poorly lit, full of drunks and couples making out in dark rides. Halloween Horror Nights, on steroids. So alcohol was banned within Disneyland to keep people from getting drunk in the area. Cast members had strict guidelines for grooming, including a complete ban on facial hair for all the men. This wasn't to discourage hippies, those wouldn't pop up for another decade, but to discourage the look of the scraggly carny. Even chewing gum wasn't sold in the park as a way to keep it from littering the pavement. These standards were not considered a wise decision by most contemporary amusement park proprietors. Here's a rough list of things Walt's park peers considered useless and financially wasteful. Custodial staff and trash cans. Lights around the park. Not selling alcohol. No carnival barkers to give a hard sell. Why would you pave the streets? No one would actually want to climb up the steps to the train station. There's no Ferris wheel. People wouldn't recognize a theme park. Having only one entrance would limit the number of visitors. Why would you open it year-round? Elements like the castle would be unneeded expenses, which won't turn a profit. Visitors wouldn't care about the quality. All of these things seem laughable not to include now, because most of us weren't alive when they weren't. At the time, it was a revolutionary technological achievement in designing communal space and it had the exact kind of classiness to attract Walt's intended audience. Because of progressive labor policies and a robust social safety net, most families in the mid-20th century had paid vacation time and funds for both a car and a vacation in that car down the brand new interstate system to Disneyland. And if a grown person is going to make the investment to take the whole family to a theme park, you better believe the experience is not only going to be proper and prestigious, but doesn't leave one member of the family uncomfortable. Walt knew that and used that, and in doing so put Disneyland on the map as not only a cultural touchstone, but a technological achievement in social design. Amusement parks were back on the map because of Disneyland, so they had to step up their game in the wake of the boom. Walt's practices spread to other parks, to varying degrees of faithfulness, and as years went by, what was once innovative became the standard. Walt famously said Disneyland would never be finished, and it was meant in a creative and spiritual sense, but it also applies to technology. Disneyland is not a museum and is under no obligation to keep things encased in amber. Old rides are swapped out for new ones, menus evolve to cater to changing needs and tastes, animatronics get updated, and this goes the same for social technology too. They can update practices to keep up with laws or react to outside events, but many changes are the result of looking at a standard and questioning why it's there in the first place. Why do we not serve alcohol in the Magic Kingdom? Are those reasons still relevant in today's culture? Why don't we apply these standards across all our parks? Would we allow the alcohol to leave the park? Would we allow the alcohol to leave the restaurant? Would it still be prestigious and family-friendly if we changed this? It's hard to think of social technology as technology because it's so ubiquitous. It's how people have acted since before we were born. It's just the way things are. Why would we change it? And then we sound like those amusement park owners from 1955. All we've known is this precedent set down by Disney, just like all they've known were the things that came before. But that's no excuse not to see if some things can be changed. Sometimes that's why it needs to be changed. We live in a world that's been consciously shaped by the people that came before us. 
And while things like standards and culture feel immutable because those decisions are so far removed from us historically, those decisions should still be scrutinized. Be they the standards of theme parks, fashion, food, governments, economic systems, what have you. They are all systems that have been decided. And those decisions can be changed. What Walt wanted, more than anything, was to innovate. So by looking at the present and making conscious changes for the future, aren't we fulfilling his dream after all? Hey there, fan cubs. Thanks for listening to this uh, different episode of Art Theory in Disneyland. Um, I saw the news about alcohol in the Magic Kingdom, and I thought it was a good time for a deep dive into the idea of social technology. And I tip my hat to Defunctland for inspiring the format, and Philosophy Tube for inspiring some of the content. So check those guys out if you enjoyed today's video. Thank you very much. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy more like this. They're a little faster to make than the normal episodes of Art Theory, but don't worry, those are coming. I'll see you guys soon.